Welcome to Research Methods, Dr. Sam Fiala. Uh, today's lecture is an introduction to behavioral science and research. Okay, so a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. Uh, a little about what is science, what are its characteristics, what are its assumptions, uh, why it should matter to you to, to learn any of this stuff, uh, a quick review of some, some basic terminology we'll be using, uh, run through the fundamentals of the scientific method, look at some different ways that uh, research is categorized, different types of research, and then talk briefly about uh, choosing a research design for your research proposal. So starting off with what science is. Uh, if we break down the word, look at the, the Latin root of science is scio, which means to know or understand, right? So science is, is a path to knowing and understanding. It also ultimately uh, can be used to refer to the knowledge that is um, discovered or built along that path right uh, and it's a great path but it's not the only path right there are other ways that you can come to know things you know say oh what should what should i do oh, well what do we know about this how do you think about how do you find out things that you know if you're not going out there um conducting science well frequently um you rely on others and so one path would be uh, authority right so this this kind of belief that you know the world's mysteries are knowable through the visions and interpretations of accepted authorities right uh, one example would be um and theology uh, theologians uh, as authorities on on faith and religious teachings uh, may clarify one facet of knowledge or another and you kind of trust that yep that's that's what it is because that's what they they say it is now obviously there are some some limitations to relying on authority for all types of knowledge right depends on the the quality of the authority right? uh, and some authorities may have um, motivations that uh, don't align well with your needs right so if you ask your friend hey uh, any pizza left in the fridge and you're gonna take it on faith on their authority that they will give you a true answer but if they want that last piece of pizza maybe they won't be so honest no nah, man there's, there's no more pizza sorry it's gone Okay, well now I have knowledge and it's true because you told me in your authority. Um, so again, sometimes we're, we're left with relying on authority uh, because we have no other choice. Uh, sometimes because we have uh, faith or trust in authorities. I'd say frequently we rely on authority uh, because we're lazy. Oh gee, what's the capital of so-and-so? Hey, hey Siri, hey Alexa, what's the capital of um, Australia? And you just trust that they're going to tell you the right thing. And again, some authorities are are reliable and trustworthy. Others may be uh, questionable. So it's good to have other paths other than just relying on authority, right? Which is one reason, uh, as we'll, we'll talk about more in a bit, that science is so important. Is you can't just rely on others to, to give you information. But again, there are other paths. So um, for with rationalism, you can only go you can only step from what you know and now you've created new knowledge okay now you can step from there so with that that example we just had uh, about anna ben and charles we all we know their relative heights and you go well, what about uh pedro are they any one of those taller than pedro shorter than pedro i, I don't know we're missing a step in the in the logic chain no no knowledge can be made right so rationalism um uh, is useful right going from what you know to something you don't know via logic and relations between things but it can only get you so far so there's empiricism uh which is good uh which um uh, believes that you know it's, it's a, a source of knowledge is the only valid source of knowledge is personal observation and experience right? so um if you want to know is it raining you know you don't ask somebody ask somebody you don't think oh do i feel like it's raining and you don't go okay well if the um that person came in and they didn't have an umbrella then it's probably not raining you stick your head outside and if you you know water hits your face yeah then it's raining um, that's empiricism right which again is good but has its limitations because there are some things that uh, are difficult to observe right if you want to know about the the structure of uh, uh, an atom without some fairly complex machinery and, and also frankly some some rationalism you're not going to get very far so there's limitations to all these things on their own but they tend to combine in our scientific method right 
because we have scientific scientific authorities that uh, um, we have faith in in terms of oh this is an appropriate method for uh, gathering data and you can always evaluate scientific methods but there are things that we tend to rely okay yeah that makes sense we'll, we'll do it that way uh, p equals 0.05 as our um, in statistics yeah that, that comes from reliance on authority that, oh that's the way they think we should do it okay we'll do it that way so that's still there right intuition is a part of science obviously if you're trying to come up with uh, new ideas new theories um, there's some kind of creative thought that goes into that and then of course uh, the bulk of when we think about scientific method is really about that combination of rationalism and empiricism right where you're collecting data and then using logic to make connections uh, between and among your findings okay. um, but one of the reasons that this the that science is so important uh, is because it's systematic and without uh, a systematic approach of combining things and doing things we get more toward that to intuition side and um, that's problematic because we are very bad computers right the human brain human mind is uh, incredibly susceptible to cognitive biases right. uh, here's a, a list of a few I've got this uh, um, I think this is linked in your um, you've got a link to this web page elsewhere as well uh, where you can look more in depth about these different cognitive biases um, that science that uh, behavioral scientists have identified uh, people uh, engage in to different degrees so there are all kinds of ways uh, we can be biased in terms of what knowledge we take in and then what uh, how we treat that knowledge and what decisions we make uh, based on that knowledge um, and our uh, our beliefs about our own thinking our kind of metacognition we are not um, for the most part we are not um, we're not Spock we're not strictly logical creatures um, we tend to um, bend our reality in our minds uh, to fit our own purposes and again that's why science is so important because we can't be trusted to um, to think logically and rationally um, all the time okay so looking at the characteristics of science obviously as I said um, it's objective right so free from personal bias and again that's the goal of science is to be as free from bias as possible and also to be um, as uh, um, open as possible so that people can see where bias comes in because there is, certainly it's not bias free right scientists uh, researchers are picking which questions to ask um, which uh, people which populations from which to draw their samples which methods to use and all those things are opportunities for bias right but because they have to report all those things publicly you can see the bias uh, if it's there um, it's empirical right which means it involves the systematic collection and analysis of data right so we're not just gonna go, oh, we'll get some people ask them some questions no there's a very specific way you're gonna do it and there are some rules involved and in how you're going to collect that data and also how you're going to analyze that data um, and that's a lot of what we'll talk about this semester uh, science is skeptical but open-minded right so what is known from science we've discovered this knowledge is always subject to revision so um, okay to date we believe that uh, people are more likely to do this than this but we could be wrong right so um, which is a little different than um, for behavioral science in particular uh, compared to some of the other sciences although those are also open to revision obviously you know uh, for most of us uh, at a time maybe there was some people thought the world is flat and then that idea was open to revision well maybe it's not so flat maybe it's round some people didn't get the memo um, but for the most part um, science is uh, again skeptical kind of like well show me where's the evidence where's the proof it's an empirical question right but there's also this open-mindedness to well hmm somebody says well could it be this science doesn't go no we know it's this way it's always been this way if you have a scientific perspective you're open to the possibility but you're skeptical of everything so maybe but show me right so not rejecting things outright not accepting things outright but somewhere in the middle uh, you know part of being that that critical thinker and science is also uh, collaborative as we said before um, science requires the publication of your methods 
uh, for verification and for replication. Again, so this is where people can see if you're uh, biased and they can also attempt to replicate your results, right? Which is huge in science because if somebody, you know, goes out and gets uh, 100 participants, even 200, 1,000 participants, and they find some effect, right? This independent variable had an effect on this dependent variable. Great, okay. But because of the way inferential statistics are, are set up, there's always some chance that the effect you found isn't real, right? right? There's some, usually it's a small chance, less than 5%, that you could have found that this difference between groups that was not caused by your independent variable, that's just due to random chance, right? And that's why it's one of the reasons it's so important to replicate results before you put too much faith in them, right? So somebody found this effect. Okay, can we find it again? And can we find it again with a slightly different group of people, right? Or if it's done on a different day of the week, if different researchers are involved, how replicable are these findings, right? And so as uh, as effects, as the relationships are replicated across studies, now our, uh, our trust in the truth, in the validity of those findings grows. If there's failure to replicate, then the trust and faith in those uh, findings erodes and eventually you start to look for, okay, maybe there's something else that's going on. And then you, maybe you find it and then you can, you have to replicate. So science is always very uh, in a state of progress. Okay, assumptions of science. Um, order is a big one, right? That there's some sort of pattern behind the chaos, that events in the world are orderly and predictable. Things don't just occur randomly, right? Uh, you heat water to a precise temperature and then it boils. If there are no patterns, there'd be no science, right? And in behavioral science, this is uh, um, probably trickier for some people to wrap their minds around than others, that um, things happen for a reason. When somebody does something, even if it's a strange behavior, right? You have um, these, uh, you know, somebody engaging in kind of violent behavior, a mass shooting, that there is a reason uh, that that happened. There's this pattern, right? And related to that, there's the belief in determinism, that for everything that happens, uh, uh, there, every effect, there's a cause, right? Um, and that if you can identify all the antecedents fully, you can completely explain an event. Now, the tricky part, particularly in behavioral science, is most behaviors are multiply determined, right? So, oh, why did they do that? Oh, because of this. Well, the this accounts for 20, 30% of the reason they did something, but there's also this and this and this and this, and there's this. And all of those things might also have determinants uh, that are uh, multiplicative. So there's order and the things happen for a reason, um, but the goal in behavioral science uh, is that is one of uh, parsimony. So when we're trying to explain why something happened, that the simplest explanation is the best, but it's not quite that simple. It's all else being equal, the simpler of two explanations is the best, right? So there's two explanations. Uh, one's fairly complex and one's simple, but the complex one explains a phenomenon 90% and the simple explanation explains it 20%. Okay, well, the complex explanation is still better because it explains more. Right? But if they both explain about the same amount, then the simpler explanation is better. Right? And that's uh, parsimony. Uh, the last one uh, has to do with proof and disproof. Uh, kind of about the, the impossibility of uh, proof or disproof with a single study. Right? No matter how well a study's done, how large the N, um, again, going back to because we rely on inferential statistics, um, so there's, there's some effect. Oh, we think, uh, you know, A causes B. In the study, you found there was a relationship to A and B that's causative. You know, these two groups differed. The only thing different about them was what we did to them. Clearly, what I did caused this thing. Okay, you could be pretty confident if you designed a good study that it caused that effect in that study. Is that is that then a universal law that this thing causes this other thing? You haven't proved that because there's all kinds of situations where it might not, it might not extend, it might not generalize. There may be some limits to the external validity of that finding, right? Same thing with disproof. Oh, we, fa we failed to find an effect, right? We, uh, um, we gave people 10 sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy 
and uh, they weren't less depressed than people that um, got no therapy. Okay, well, you haven't disproved that therapy works. You failed to show that therapy worked in that sample, but there could be some other group that it uh, would have worked with. There could be something wrong with your approach, with the way you measured. Um, maybe wrong, uh, the therapists weren't very good. There's all kinds of reasons why you might not have found a relationship between variables, between constructs that is real. You just didn't, you didn't observe it. You didn't catch it. Right? So we're building uh, uh, support for theories or, or again or we're eroding support for theories but with no study can you ever prove or disprove uh, something in behavioral science okay so with uh, all these things being said you know what's uh, behavioral science good for why what are the what can we do with it well I always think about uh, dupsy uh, you can describe uh, behavior Kind of a, a bigger goal is uh, trying to understand behavior, trying to understand the um, the relationships between uh, uh, variables, particularly causal ones, right? Why did this happen this way at this time with this person, right? Uh, you know, why don't some why don't people uh, help someone in need when uh, there's a big crowd around, right? Look at those those uh, social psych studies of uh, diffusion of social responsibility. Um, Science is, behavioral science is good for that, trying to figure out, well, why does this happen? Uh, predicting behavior, right? Um, if A, then B. So trying to predict, okay, um, who's going to be successful in grad school? Who's going to be less successful? Right? We can measure uh, variables, find relationships, and then use those relationships to make predictions, right? Because it's systematic. And again, not that we can uh, see the future with any kind of great clarity, but the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, right? So if we see over and over this happens again, right? Every time um, Lucy says she's going to hold the ball for Charlie Brown, he's like, okay, cool. I'm going to go kick it. And every time she pulls away at the last minute, at some point, you've got several data points suggesting that she's not going to let you kick the ball, Charlie Brown, right? So a predictive model based on behavioral science would say, stop trying uh, to kick the ball, Charlie. Uh, just get a T. The C, control. Um, behavioral science can help us uh, uh, control behavior, not in more like a, a Machiavellian evil overlord way, but in terms of influencing behavior, right? Um, we can use behavioral science to figure out techniques to, uh, you know, reduce um, uh, people's um, uh, initiation uh, of smoking, of kind of uh, self-harming behaviors, uh, of reducing violence. Uh, you know, what interventions can be put in place to uh, encourage people to uh, go to the doctor more often, save more money, um, right? We can, uh, a lot of behavioral science is used to try to discover um, what things influence behavior so that then people with power can exert their influence to get people to do hopefully the right thing, mostly uh, to buy stuff. That's, that's really, advertisers use a lot of behavioral science um, to make you buy stuff you don't need. Um, well, can science tell you what the right thing to do is, though, right? So it can it can describe behavior, it can help you understand behavior, help you predict behavior. It can even be used to uh, identify things that where you can control behavior. But can it tell you what to do? Well, probably not. Probably not. Um, but the right thing to do isn't a scientific question, right? Uh, you know, should I should I recycle? That's not a scientific question. That's a values question. Right now, we can apply science to that question and say, okay, well, if you um, have that plastic jug and you uh, don't recycle it, you put it in the garbage, goes in a landfill, and we can use science to figure out, okay, how long will that take to break down? And um, we can look at, will it release any contaminants into the earth that could uh, uh, negatively impact the uh, groundwater? We can all say, okay, uh, how much energy is going to be needed to um, clean and reuse uh, these materials? And if you're burning you know, fossil fuels to do that, what's the cost of that? Right? We can, there's all these data you can get with science to then help you figure out what the right thing to do is. But again, science can't tell you what the right thing to do is. All it can do is give you information. It can give you data. Right? And then uh, should, should science inform your values? I think so, but again, that's my value. 
that's not a, a fact. It's not a grand truth. It's just my opinion. Um, um, because if you're forming your values uninformed by science, you, you might make some foolish uh, mistakes, right? Again, if you think the, the, you're going to ignore science and say the world is flat and then base some values on that, that could lead you in the wrong direction, maybe. Um, related to that, why should any of this uh, matter to you? So why should science uh, be important to you in, in terms of influencing your values and, and beyond that? One of the biggest things is um, critical thinking protects you, right? In science, scientific method is, is all about, particularly in this course, I want you to focus on critically evaluating the information that comes at you, right? Because every day you're bombarded with um, uh, media stories um, that uh, report and draw conclusions on uh, research results. More often they just report what other people have reported that they've heard that somebody else said. But sometimes they actually do say, uh, oh, scientists have now found and they tell you, hey, this is what it is. And if you don't think critically, if you rely on authority and your the authority figure is uh, some sort of media presence, which is owned by typically uh, some corporation whose motivation isn't to share truth with you, but their motivation is to make money, which is fair. That's what they're designed to do. Well, if you can't think critically, then you're just going to be buying whatever they have to tell you. And it may not always be true. Right. So you've got to be able to uh, critically evaluate the information uh, coming at you, right? Otherwise, uh, you'll be living in an alternate reality, right, with alternative facts. Um, it should matter to you in terms of your professional life, right? Being able to understand research is relevant to many professions. Uh, many of you will be involved in the mental health professions, right? Reading research and making decisions about treatment, facilities, medications, testing procedures, Science provides a foundation for what you do, right? If you aren't well tethered to the scientific community and you're a mental health professional, then you are a quack, right? And that's a strong statement, but that, uh, and that's a value statement, but it's one I think I can support, right? The mental health profession has a, a empirical foundation, right? We do these things because we've done the research showing that doing these things leads to uh, changes in this direction, right? And these theories that we use have uh, empirical basis, right? Empirically supported treatments. You've heard those buzzwords. They mean something, right? If you don't have that tether, then how are you different from some sort of uh, mystic or shaman or, uh, you know, the music man driving into town saying, I've got the best thing. Uh, I'm going to you know wrap this sheet around you and you fight your way out and you'll be reborn in the world. And that's going to cure you of all your uh, anxiety and depression. Well, you're, you're no different if you don't have that kind of scientific uh, foundation. Um, even outside of that profession, uh, uh, those of you who are going to be educators, obviously it's very important to keep up with the effectiveness of teaching strategies, uh, of ways of dealing with uh, problem students, right? And there has been a push in the past 10, 15 years of uh, using um, research-supported approaches in education. Outside that, in business, obviously, they rely on research to make decisions about uh, marketing strategies, improving employee morale, ways to select and train employees, right? More and more in all kind of professional walks of life, people are making data-based decisions, right? And so if you've got a good foundation of how to be an empirical thinker and how to conduct and evaluate research, you're going to be an asset in terms of uh, being involved in a, uh, the process of making data-based decisions rather than people saying, oh, we did a survey and well, we're gonna do what we've always done and we'll try to figure out what, what it says in the survey that will back up what we wanna do. If you're an empiricist, you can say, no, 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 let's look at actually what it said to inform policy rather than trying to wrap data around our own um, existing biases. Uh, obviously, related to this, decision, decisions that impact you are made based on research, right? Uh, Public policy is increasingly, uh, well, for a while, it was increasingly being informed by uh, research. There's a little bit of a slip in that right now, but I'm sure it'll come back around. Um, where legislatures, political leaders at all levels are taking positions based on, on research findings, right? And there are uh, different uh, lobby groups, research groups that will you know, provide research findings to uh, the decision makers and say, hey, 
this is what you should do and here's the data that say uh, why you should do it um, like the uh, that they can't uh, um, you can't advertise uh, you don't see ads for smoking on TV right well, why not well it, there's some science that went on behind that about uh, the negative impacts of uh, smoking and about the uh, influences of advertising and those things together influence the policy of saying no you can't advertise um, cigarettes on TV right um, private sector decisions also uh, influenced by science right um, what treatments in terms of uh, medical mental health uh, will your insurance company pay for right when they're looking not to pay for things they'll say well is this uh, approach does it have empirical support if not we can't pay for it right so um, it's important to be able to know how to read research finders and say no no look it is here is the support uh, if you're just kind of um, blissfully floating along in ignorance and you accept whatever scientific data people offer you as proof of their claims um, then then good good luck to you um, but hopefully you don't want to do that hopefully you want to be able to uh, have that kind of skeptical mind and go oh they said research says what do they mean by that let me see the research and you'll have those skills to be able to read it competently and say oh no yeah well, that is good they're right that this is valid research maybe they have a point or oh this is bogus they had a sample size of four what are you talking about right you should you should have those skills uh, and of course you can conduct research right uh, either formally as a, a scientist right doing IRB approved research or uh, informally right in your own life you can collect uh, uh, data systematically analyze it you don't need high-powered stats to do a lot of data analysis um, and you can use that to influence what you do you know hey do I really um, save money by um, using uh, these coupons versus not right you can rather than just go I don't know I kind of think so you can figure if you are good at science you can figure out a way to collect those data organize uh, the data analyze it and come up with um, some conclusions all right so a quick review of some terminology uh, variables uh, variables are things that um, we manipulate uh, control or measure and, and beyond that uh, a variable is anything that can vary it can have different values right so if you say um, You know what color is uh, you know that car well that's not a variable that's that's a constant that car is red okay car color that's a variable because cars can come in different colors right so in the terminology is important so when you talk at the level of okay um, mood mood is a variable this person's mood right now well, that's not a variable right that's a piece of data so uh, but most things you can think of are probably can be said in a form that they are uh, variables and some variables we manipulate right where we're gonna have two different groups and we're gonna treat them differently right we're gonna put one in a hot room one in a cold room so the variable that we've manipulated is temperature right we don't say uh, the variable is hot room or cold room no those are two different levels of that variable the variable is temperature of the room right there are some variables that we control so let's say we're not interested in temperature of the room we're interested in uh, you know in one room people are gonna get uh, scared by a clown in one room uh, they're not we want them, them to be in equally comfortable rooms so we're to control temperature room both rooms are exactly 72 degrees okay so we've controlled that variable so that it's the same for both groups and then there are the variables that we measure that we're collecting data on right so how many math problems did that did they get right uh, how long did it take them to run out of the room screaming um, what was their heart rate all these things uh, beyond that there uh, another way to think about variables is there are variables of interest things that we're interested in the study usually those are the ones that we're manipulating uh, and measuring and then there are extraneous variables and those are more often the ones we're either uh, controlling or trying to control right so we're looking at a relationship between let's say two variables simplest form those two variables are variables of interest now there are other variables that will impact both of those variables and impact their relationship those are extraneous variables they're outside our area of interest and again we'll try to control those as much as possible but ultimately we won't be able to control them fully and we just accept that okay 
we're not going to get uh, kind of this pure, uh, perfect, um, you know, kind of uh, chemistry lab type of setting where we can go, okay, yep, here's the exact relationship between the two variables because we know, we acknowledge there are some extra, some outside variables that we won't be able to account for that are going to muck up uh, our research. Operational definitions. Um, so in behavioral science, quite frequently, we like to study constructs, right? And constructs being ideas, ideas that are constructed, that are made. They're not tangible things. Um, love, intelligence, um, mood, right? These are constructs, right? You can't say, uh, show me how many pounds of mood do you have, right? You can't do that. But we kind of have this idea, okay, mood is this um, extended uh, emotional state, right? And we can kind of describe it, we can measure it, and um, to study constructs, you have to come up with operational definitions. How are you operationally, as you're doing things, going to define what it is, right? So this is a process of making constructs observable and quantifiable. So uh, if mood is the construct, and I give you the Fiala mood questionnaire, okay, then uh, mood will be uh, operationally defined by score on the Fiala mood questionnaire, right? That's one operational definition. I could do it several ways, right? If I think, okay, um, I think when people's, uh, one indicator of mood is uh, um, reliance on comfort food. So I put, you know, bowls of M&Ms uh, in front of people and, uh, um, you know, negative mood will be uh, operationally defined as number of M&Ms people eat um, while we're making them, you know, feel bad or trying to make them feel bad. So there are all kinds of ways to operationally define things. You just have to pick one that works best for your study and then explicitly communicate that um, when publishing your results. Uh, theory, uh, conceptual framework about relationships among construct, constructs. This is that kind of big idea, uh, like a attachment theory. Okay, that these early experiences are gonna have these influences on building this internal uh, model of self, uh, other, and the world. Right? And quite frequently from theory, we're able to draw down hypotheses, right? Which are testable predictions about relationships among variables, right? Theories often can't be tested directly. You can't, okay, uh, oh, this is your theory? Let's test that theory. Well, we can derive a hypothesis from that theory. If that theory is true, then we should see this thing happening, right? That's what the hypothesis is. And you can test the hypothesis. And then if the hypothesis is, uh, confirmed or, or not confirmed, that either lends support for the theory or erodes support for the theory. Um, overview of the scientific method starts off with observation, typically, right? Just kind of wondering, huh, are these things related? What might be the cause of this? Uh, which, uh, which people do this more um, than other people? And then from there, you don't just go, oh, let's design a study to be really, um, part of the scientific community, the next step is to review existing theory and evidence, right? Because science should be cumulative. It should build upon uh, existing knowledge, right? And it, it doesn't always, sometimes people have a, a brand new idea and it's totally unrelated to anything and knowledge kind of splinters off. But typically what we want to do is, okay, I wonder about this. Well, what do we currently collectively believe? And again, there's not like there's this huge unity of belief about human behavior, but there are these kind of different schools of thought and your research ideas should be able to fit somewhere in one of those schools of thought, either to support it or maybe to counter it, but it should be in relation to it. If it's not in relation to it, if it's not going to, uh, you know, build up a theory or bring down a theory, it's not as useful, right? Because we need to move the knowledge collectively forward. If it's just separate, I don't know how it relates to that theory. Well, we still have this theory over here. If you, your study isn't related at all, I don't know where to put it, right? So you review existing theory or evidence, and then you postulate an extension of existing theory, or you say, here's this new theory. You know, so far people think, they think uh, um, people make higher decisions based on these factors. However, what they haven't considered is it may be, maybe this other one is a better predictor than those, right? So better than is in relation to, right? And so, but it's a new theory. It's not these, it's this thing, and this thing will out predict uh, those other things. And then you derive a hypothesis from a theory, as we talked about already, uh, conduct a systematic test, 
of the hypothesis and real emphasis on that systematic test. You can't just let's see what happens. Right? There are lots of rules about how to do it, and that's something we'll talk about uh, across the semester. And then you analyze the data to determine the probability that the results of the hypothesis test are due to chance. Right? And that's where the inferential stats come in. Okay, we got these two groups. We made them as similar as possible, except for the one thing we did differently to this group. Okay, and now we found that they now they shouldn't be different if our, what we did to them had no effect, but they are different. Okay, how likely it is? How likely is it that uh, we would have found that difference if the thing we did didn't have an effect? Right, that's what you're doing, that's what you're doing with with your stats, and then you relate your findings back to uh, the theory. Uh, your theory and the, the previous theory of evidence. So you started off with, okay, where does this idea nest in here? Conduct the study, find the results, and then you've got to relate it back. Yep, I fit now, I've now supported this uh, earlier theory, or now I've found that that earlier theory has some limitations. It's not always true. Here's where it's not true. Because again, we want to collectively move that knowledge forward and not just splinter off in a thousand different directions because um, then you're, you, don't, you aren't going to make progress. Um, different ways to categorize research, uh, basic versus applied, often has to do with uh, just the proximity to real world application of the results. So uh, applied research obviously has uh, is very proximal, very close to real world applications, right? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, whereas uh, Basic research is, is a more uh, distal, it's more distant in terms of the, the application of the results. Um, so some basic research might be, um, you know, can people remember some words better than others? Okay, yeah, that's kind of a basic science question. Are there differences in that some words can be remembered better than others? I don't really see how that helps us, but okay. Right? And if we move along, this, there's this continuum of basic to applied. It's not really two categories, even though I said different ways to categorize research, as with most things in life, uh, they occur in a dimension. So we move along this dimension of basic to applied. Uh, so, okay, they can remember some words better than others. Well, um, what about uh, when people are depressed, can they remember some words better than others? Okay, well, that's getting a little more applicable. So it sounds like you're getting into are there these differences for these groups of people that are depressed, not depressed? That may be useful in helping people with depression. And you can go further along that spectrum. Can memory be improved by treating depression? Okay, that's a very applied question, right? So the degree to which your what your findings are can be directly applied to uh, typically help people have some influence on people. The more applied the research is, the further away it is, the more basic it is. And again, it occurs on a continuum, and these things typically influence each other, right? Applied research is built upon basic research, right? Whenever uh, I talked about, go back and look at existing evidence, when you're doing an applied study, you're, you may be looking at some uh, other applied studies, but quite frequently, you're looking back at the basic research. So, okay, fundamentally, here's what's going on with people, and now I'm using that to make some predictions about how to apply that knowledge uh, in a real-world setting. And again, when we do these real-world setting uh, studies, especially ones that we think will confirm what we know based on basic science, and we don't confirm, we kind of know that's the opposite, then that's a signal back to the people doing basic research. Hey guys, uh, there's something something different here. Look again. So that may feed back into, and they do more basic research. Like, oh, okay, yeah, here's what's happening here. And they're kind of the, the uh, behind the scenes nuts and bolts of, uh, of behavior. Um, yeah, so some types of applied research that we'll uh, pay particular attention to are uh, clinical outcome research, right? So which type of treatment is better? Um, do people get better with this treatment versus placebo? Uh, and then also program evaluation, right? Doing a um, needs assessment, determining if uh, uh, any kind of some sort of system organization is um, meeting its goals. Um, that's something that, that uh, counselors in particular often uh, is helpful to them. Qualitative versus quantitative research. Uh, and this often boils down to the type of data, right? So kind of raw data used more in qualitative research. You know, you ask people about their opinions on something and they just talk to you or they write down narratives and you're looking at those raw data. Well, that's qualitative. Now, if you quantify that data, so if uh, they 
what's your opinion on this? They start like, no, 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 don't tell me. Circle this number on a piece of paper on a scale of one to five if you agree or disagree. Now you've had them quantify their opinion. Well, now you're doing quantitative research. So to some degree, it just has to do with the data. If it's more uh, narrative uh, versus numbers, quantified. But they also differ in the type of questions they can ask, right? Qualitative research uh, is pretty good for that, those initial questions of, you know, why might this be happening, right? Quantitative research can't do that at all, right? You can't uh, do a quantitative study saying, um, why are some people uh, more depressed than others? Now, if you say, okay, here are three, three reasons people might be more depressed than others, and then you want to look at, okay, so if people um, have uh, more negative thoughts, smaller um, uh, social groups, and uh, more disrupted sleep, are they more depressed people that don't have those things? Okay, that's a quantitative question, because I can measure all those things quantitatively. But then I have to have identified these potential causes. If I really don't know, I'm just kind of open. I don't know what, what might be going on. That's going to be qualitative research. We're going to go interview people. Hey, you're, you're depressed? Yeah, I'm depressed. Tell me about what's going on. And they're going to talk about things like, oh, I cannot sleep, and uh, uh, you know, nobody's hanging around with me. And again, you might discover that knowledge that way. But then I'm you know, and uh, uh, I'm eating a lot of gluten. And I think the gluten's causing me to be depressed. I don't know if that's true. But you might discover it in qualitative. With quantitative, you wouldn't have known to look for that thing, maybe. And so you wouldn't have discovered it. So qualitative is a little more wide open. Uh, and quantitative uh, is much more focused. So they both have their limitations, right? Qualitative advantage being it's much more wide open. You're going to catch things you won't catch with quantitative. But because it's so much more wide open, it's also uh, more likely to be influenced um, by uh, subjectivity. It's harder to be objective, right? Because if you're getting this, these long narratives from people, you, or maybe even a team of researchers, has to decide and pull out, okay, what are the themes? What's significant here? And what you pull out is going to be influenced by your own biases. It's hard not to do that. Right? And then quantitative is going to be more objective. But because of its focus, it's also more limited in terms of it's, it's got a more narrow lens and um, what you're looking for. All you can do, you can't say what's going on. You can say, is this going on? Right. You can only find what you're looking for. Um, and then uh, there's descriptive, correlational, quasi-experimental uh, and experimental research all under the quantitative umbrella. Under the qualitative umbrella, uh, even more things, which we'll talk about in a, a later lecture. Um, and just briefly, descriptive is about uh, you know summarizing uh, data. Correlational is about relationships uh, among uh, variables. Jump over to experimental is about cause and effect. Quasi-experimental -ex quasi wants to be about cause and effect. It wants to be experimental, but for one reason or another, it can't quite be. So it's kind of in between um, correlational and experimental. Okay, so it goes to a little more in depth in uh, these types of research. Descriptive research, right? as the name implies, describe what is, right? Um, there are no predictions or hypotheses about relationships between variables. You just want to know, you know, um, how much, um, how many, what's the average, uh, what amount of variability is there, what's going on with some some group of people, some phenomenon, some some behavior. Uh, something that's not going to be appropriate for your proposal paper in this class. You've got to go beyond descriptive research. You can't just say, uh, I want to know, um, you know, how many first graders in Texas um, are reading on a first grade level. Well, that's an interesting question, but it's not sufficient for your research proposal. You got to, if that, and we can talk about how to go beyond that to make it the, another type of research. Um, different types of descriptive uh, study designs. Uh, a simple descriptive design, we've got, you know, one group at one point in time. Uh, a comparative descriptive design, we've got two or more groups at one point in time, right? So you can say, okay, uh, I want to look at the, um, you know, what percentage of first graders in Texas are reading on a first grade level when they finish, and same, same thing for uh, first graders in Louisiana. And again, that can be important data to have and it can influence uh, possibly some decisions. Right? But it can't tell you anything beyond that, right? Well, why are they different? I don't know. It's a different study. All I can tell you is, and are they uh, statistically significantly different? Uh, I, I don't know. One's, you know, if this is, one has 84%, uh, the other has 87%. Okay, are those really different percentages? 
Well, that, now we're getting to a different, uh, slightly different uh, type of research question. If all you want to know is what the percentages are, what are you describing? That's a descriptive research. And then your more uh, kind of developmental ones, uh, longitudinal, cross-sectional, and cross-sequential designs. Uh, longitudinal, where you're following one group over time, right? So you're looking, okay, um, we get this group of first graders and we're looking at um, their scores on some, some measure of reading ability. And then we're going to measure them again at second grade, at, after third grade, after fourth grade, right? Um, Cross-sectional is different groups uh, that are different based on age or time, but measuring it all at one point in time. So we're looking at, okay, in this in Texas, um, using this reading measure to look at first graders, second graders, third graders, and fourth graders. Right? Cross-sequential is basically a combination of those. We're going to get some uh, first graders, second graders, and third graders, and we're going to measure them this year. We're going to follow all those groups again next year when they're now second, third, and fourth, and the next year when they're third, fourth, and fifth, and then on and on and on. So in this, in this class proposal, you're going to do more than that. You're going to do at least a correlational proposal. And a correlational search looks at relationship, relationships uh, among or between variables, right? Between two variables or among more than two variables. Um, important to keep in mind, you can't infer causality from correlation research, right? So just because two things are correlated, just because they're they're related, doesn't mean that one causes the other, right? Two primary reasons for this: the third variable problem, right? So um, there is a, a statistically significant correlation between the number of ashtrays uh, in a home and the number of people in that home uh, that will develop lung cancer. So clearly, ashtrays cause lung cancer. Well, no, there's a third variable, right? There's a third variable that's related to both of those two variables we've talked about, ashtrays and cancer, that explains their relationship in a causal manner, right? People who smoke, that causes you to have ashtrays. People who smoke, that causes you to have cancer. So that third variable is causing the other two, making those original two variables related, but they're not related in a causal sense. There's something else uh, going on. Uh, the other reason we can't uh, confidently infer causality from correlation is directionality, right? So these two things are related. Oh, so A causes B. Maybe. What if B causes A, right? Which happened first? Especially if there's not some sort of clear temporal relationship between the two, where one we don't know which one happened first. Uh, there's a, a high rate of comorbidity, co-occurrence, for anxiety and depression, right? So... Does being anxious uh, cause people to be depressed? Or does being depressed cause people to be anxious? We don't know. And probably most of the research suggests it's a bit of both. And it depends on the individual and what type of anxiety and how long, what type of depression, how it manifests, all those things. But there does seem to be a bi-directional relationship between those variables. And that's true among a, a lot of variables, that it's not a simple uh, unidirectional causal relationship, that there's kind of some uh, feedback loops uh, involved. So just because we observe a relationship between two variables, and it kind of even, it even might make sense, I think this causes this. Does it? Right? So you have these kids playing violent video games and being violent. Does that, did that, did the video games cause them to be violent? Or is there something about kids that, uh, something else that's going on that will then push them towards violent video games, they enjoy that, and also push them towards violence? Maybe they see a lot of violence, and so the video games are familiar, and they're, they're not freaked out by it. And also, the seeing violence models that behavior, and so they're going to, based on kind of social learning theory, engage in similar behaviors. Maybe. Um, so we can't infer causality because of correlation, but correlation is certainly uh, points in the direction of possible causation. But you have to go beyond correlation research to establish causation. You can use correlation research to identify might might there be a cause and effect here? Because if there's cause and effect, there should be a relationship, should be a correlation. Once I can establish a correlation, okay, now let me come back later with an experimental design to see uh, if it really is uh, a causal. Uh, the variables we talk about in correlation research, uh, refer to them as uh, predictor and criterion, or uh, sometimes instead of criterion, you'll see the term uh, outcome, so predictor variable and outcome variable. Um, some people will slip up and, and use independent and dependent variable, but those terms should really be used for experimental 
research for correlation correlation research to help kind of not confuse people into these especially this distinction about causality you should use these other terms predictor and criterion where the thing you're predicting with is the predictor and the thing you're predicting to is the criterion or outcome so um, if we're looking at the relationship between um, high school GPA and college GPA which one's the predictor which one's the criterion well, probably you're not thinking, hey, I wonder with college GPA, can I predict what your high school GPA was? That's kind of a weird question. More likely, you're going to be saying, if I know somebody's high school GPA, can I predict what their college GPA will be? Right. So the high school GPA is a predictor, college GPA is criterion. But there is some flexibility there because maybe you do want to go backwards. And if so, you flip it. The different types of relationships... Um, you can observe with correlation research most frequently we think just about the linear ones right is there some sort of linear relationship between variables where as one increases the other increases or as one decreases the other decreases or flip that as one increases the other decreases in this kind of linear step down fashion where if we plot it out in a graph we see this nice kind of line type function those are correlations there can also be uh, curvilinear relationships between variables that are still correlations right the the class one of the classic ones being the relation between anxiety and performance right at low levels of anxiety we often have low levels of performance man i want to do fine on this test i don't even need to study you're going to fail right whereas you get a little more anxious you study a little more you're going to do better and better and better and at some point if we keep increasing anxiety performance doesn't keep going up performance starts to come down right because anxiety is now impairing it so there's this curvilinear relationship between anxiety and performance, that's still a correlation. And then another one that I think confuses people a lot is group differences, right? If we're doing non-experimental research, uh, if we're looking, okay, um, do men and, men and women differ on um, this variable? Okay, well, that's not experimental because you're not assigning people to be men or women. You're just looking at, is there a relationship between gender and some variable? That's a correlation, right? But you're not getting uh, correlation coefficients. You're getting, oh, there's this mean difference. And you're going to be getting, you know, T-tests or ANOVA. And when you see those T-tests and ANOVA, you think, oh, that must be experimental. It's not. That's a correlation. So group differences can still be uh, indicative of um, correlations. Typically, though, we want to try to quantify these relationships. And we will try to, uh, especially for linear and curvilinear relationships, put them into this kind of correlation coefficient. Right? For linear, the most common we use is the Pearson R, right? which can range from negative 1 to positive 1, and the middle is 0. So if there's no relationship, correlation is 0. If it's a perfect relationship, it's either negative 1 or 1. Those are equally strong relationships. right? They're just showing different things. right? For a positive correlation, if it's over on the one side, as one goes up, the other goes up. Also, as one goes down, the other goes down. So the two things co-vary in the same direction. That's a positive correlation. If two things co-vary in opposite directions, as one goes up, the other goes down. As one goes down, the other goes up. Now that's a negative correlation. Right? So important to keep those straight. Um, in terms of different types of correlational designs, there's the explanatory uh, correlational design, which is kind of uh, descriptive correlational, where you're just two, uh, measuring two things, saying, you know, is there this relationship between these things? And yep, okay, people who do this more, do this more. Here it is, and that's all you're doing. Uh, predictive correlational designs are where you're looking more at uh, predicting something happening uh, from measuring something earlier. So we're going to measure this now, and then wait, and then measure this other thing, and see if there's a relationship if we're able to predict an outcome with a, an earlier observation. And then there are uh, model testing correlation designs, uh, like moderation, which I won't get into too much detail here now. But again, trying to tease apart, especially with those, you know, uh, A and B are related, but A and B are related in this way. But if C, that relationship changes. Okay, well, that's a, maybe a different kind of more sophisticated correlation design uh, we'll talk more about in the future. Quasi experimental research, which again I said wants causality, wants to be experimental, not quite good enough. This is the JV uh, on the, the uh, on the team uh, where experimental is varsity, quasi experimental is the, is the junior varsity. Uh, the variables uh, you don't have an independent and dependent, you have a quasi independent variable and a dependent variable. So what's missing that makes it quasi experimental? Typically, 
it's uh, the ability to assign participants to condition, right? You often you're doing things kind of kind of experimentally where you're doing it, you are manipulating a variable maybe, right? I'm gonna do this to this group and do this to this group, but they're existing groups, right? So I've got this first grade class and this first grade class, and I'm gonna treat them differently and see what happens. Okay, well you didn't randomly assign people to be in those classes, so you're not quite sure if they were equal before you started. And now it's quasi experimental. Or there may be some limitations in the amount of experimental, experimental control you can exert that uh, drop it out of the experimental category. Uh, and then sometimes it's having a, a small n. There are a particular type of quasi-experimental research we'll talk about in a minute where you have you know one, two, three, four people, and that makes it uh, a different type of design, which again moves it out of this experimental category into quasi-experimental. So the types, uh, a single group post-test only, design so you just do some of the people and then you you know I, I get a bunch of people they uh take therapy and then i measure how depressed they are hey they're not very depressed okay well are they less depressed than they were before i don't know but they're not depressed now see look well if you don't have pre post it's not experimental and you don't have some other group that you did something different to it's not experimental um, non-equivalent control group design so now I do have two groups, experimental group and uh, a control group, but uh, again, I didn't assign them to groups. So it's, I don't know that those groups were the same before I did something to them. So it's a non-equivalent control group. I'm not sure that those groups are equi <coughs> excuse me, equivalent. The non-equivalent control group pre-test, post-test design gets a little better. Or again, maybe I have those um, you know, two first grade classes and I do pre-post on both of them. I've got a little stronger argument that this gets closer to experimental from quasi-experimental because I can show statistically if they were similar or not at the beginning, but still they may have been different in ways that I didn't measure because I didn't randomly assign them. So it's not perfect. Uh, time series designs, won't go into too much detail about, uh, similar to um, longitude designs where I'm measuring uh, repeatedly uh, across time. And the single end designs, which we'll talk about uh, a lot more toward the end of the semester. Uh, this is that small end where you've got maybe you know one person, but you're doing um, uh, multiple observations in such a way that you're exerting lots of experimental control, lots of measurement, which gives it a bit more internal validity, a little more experimental. But again, it's just uh, you know one person or a small group of people. And again, we'll, we'll circle back to those later. Experimental research. This is the, the one that kind of the gold standard where because you can infer causality if it's done properly. The variables, as I alluded to before, uh, are referred to as independent variable and dependent variable. The three hallmarks of a, an experimental study, the things that uh, need to be there, uh, manipulation of an independent variable, right? So the researcher has to do something different to one group than another or different to, so, to some group before and after you know uh, they've, they've measured um, some dependent variable. Uh, thing about limitations though, can you manipulate any variable? Well, no, there's some limitations, right? If I want to look at the you know uh, the impact of uh, um, well, geez, uh, it's really probably important to know the impact of. Um, you know, loss of some sort of bodily function, uh, being paralyzed, losing a limb, uh, whatever, some sort of traumatic thing that happens to the body. What's the impact of that on people's social emotional functioning? That's an important question for behavioral science. You can't do an experiment on that. You can't subject people to these losses uh, against their will. So there's some questions that really difficult to conduct experimental research on, which is why you see uh, there's still a place for one reason, there's still a place for correlation research, even when you want to know cause and effect, sometimes you just can't. There's some variables that you can't manipulate either because of practicality uh, or because of uh, ethics. But to be experimental, you have to be able to manipulate the IV. Uh, you need a power to assign to condition or groups. And again, this is all about establishing uh, equivalence, right? Because so we want to get equivalent groups and then treat them differently and see if our manipulation led to non-equivalence. And so if I can assign you to groups, and I do so randomly, then these groups should be roughly equal, roughly equivalent. They're not guaranteed to be, but if I have a big enough group, according to uh, probability, mathematics, statistics, they should be roughly equivalent, should be the same. 
And then the third thing, I have to be able to exert experimental control. And that's all about, if I've got these in the simplest form, two groups, the only way they differ is in what I did to them. So they're uh, being measured at the same time by the same people with the same temperature room, same lighting, um, same noise level, all these other extraneous variables. I'm trying to control those, exert experimental control, so that when I'm measuring this dependent variable, any differences between groups will only be influenced by what I did to them, which is the independent variable. So I have to be able to exert experimental control. If I can't exert enough experimental control, it's not an experiment, falls down to quasi. Okay, real quickly, and we'll come back to these, uh, I promise, in the future. Different types of experimental design between subjects where you've got, um, you know, at least two different groups where one group gets the one level of the IV, the other groups gets the other level. So drug and placebo. But whoever gets the drug doesn't get placebo. Whoever gets placebo doesn't get drug. Within subjects, so repeated measures design, where typically you have one group, but you're gonna, they're going to get uh, measured multiple times. So they're going to um, measure how depressed you are, uh, give you the drug, measure how depressed you are, give you placebo, measure how depressed you are. Right. So you'll get that one group, each person will get all levels of the independent variable. Uh, a match subjects design. This is where I'm trying to increase the equivalence uh, between groups where I'm going to um, match people on some key variable like intelligence or depression. Uh, okay, get the two most depressed people and I'll randomly assign one to uh, experimental group, one to control group. Next to most depressed people, one, randomly assign one to experimental, one to control. So on and so forth to increase um, the uh, um, degree of their equivalence and then I can um, compare them uh, pairwise, kind of like I do with within subjects. And again, we'll come back to that because that was complicated. Uh, the last one being a mixed subjects design. We have at least one independent, we have two independent variables, at least, at least one of which is between subjects and one of which is within subjects. And this is kind of the classic example would be if you have a treatment study where you're going to measure everybody, you have two groups, measure everybody on, let's say, anxiety time one, and then you do something different to the two groups, measure anxiety again time two. Okay. So you have a between groups variable, one group got therapy, the other didn't, but you also have time pre and post. Pre and post is a within subjects variable. Everybody got time one measurement, everybody got time two measurement, so everybody experienced time. So that's a mixed subject design because you have those two, two different types of variables. Okay, so choosing a design. So thinking about uh, for your research proposal, well, what am I gonna do? Which of these designs is gonna be best for me? Depends on your question. What do you want to know, right? So do you want to know, you know, what's happening here? And then you also need to research to figure out, because if you just have that question of what's going on, I kind of want to know what's up with this. Okay, that's going to be too too broad, too vague for this proposal, because you could do a nice qualitative study with that. But again, for the, for this class, you've got to do a quantitative uh, proposal. So you can start with what's happening and then do your research to figure out what people think is happening and then test whether or not that's true. But you can't do, well, what's going on? Why is this happening? It's too broad. You've got to, you've got to focus more to get it in the kind of that quantitative realm. So uh, if you're interested in, is, it a, is there some sort of causal relationship going on? Then you're probably going to look at an experimental design. If you want to look more, or I just want to know, can we predict who's going to be better at this, who's worse at this? Okay, then a correlational design might be might be good for you if you're interested in change okay so uh, across time um, will people be different you know when this thing happens that's probably also going to be an experimental design probably within subjects experimental design if you're interested in cause and effect you gotta think well the independent variable i'm looking at is it practical is it ethical is it possible to manipulate it if so i can do Experimental. If not, I may have to drop down to quasi or maybe I have to rethink it and do a correlation research that can't show causality, but will be based probably on some causal assumptions. The other thing to think about is, can you assign people to different levels of the IV? Right? And that'll help determine if you can use an experiment or you have to drop down to something else. Okay, uh, I know this is a lot, um, but this is a kind of foundational uh, lecture for the course. Take home, kind of trying to sum up some of the key points. Science is valuable, 
but not perfect, right? It is a path to knowledge. It's not the only path to knowledge. Again, obviously my bias, my value is that it's extremely important, but I also acknowledge that there are other ways to know things and the other types of knowledge that are valuable and should influence um, what you do in life, the choices you make, what the right thing to do is. But if science isn't part of that equation of figuring out what the right thing to do is, I think you're in danger and society is in danger. Uh, science is uh, systematic and it attempts to reduce and expose areas of bias, right? So it tries to reduce bias, but it's not bias free. It's not neutral, but because it's public, it, it, it's kind of self exposing of its own bias where you can see these are the participants I chose. Yep. I had only, uh, um, you know, people who were second generation, uh, Filipino Americans in my study. So it's limited to the things I found may be limited to people that have that that background, right? You're going to be uh, explicit and open about how you did things uh, and what you found, right? Because science is um, collaborative. Research designs differ. They differ primarily in terms of what kind of questions they can answer. Also on how data are collected or analyzed. A quick caveat there. There are differences in research designs and how the data are analyzed, but a data analysis method does not dictate what type of research methodology you're using, right? You think, oh, uh, I'm doing ANOVA, therefore it's an experiment. No. Analysis of variance ANOVA is just a way of looking at group differences. You can look, look at group differences with a wide variety of methodological approaches, different research designs. So the, the, the stat you use doesn't dictate what type of design you use, right? What type of design you use might dictate what kind of stat you can use in combination with how your data are coded, but it doesn't work any other way. So just because you know what stat they use doesn't mean you know what type of method it was. Okay. Uh, in all these different research designs do have different strengths uh, and limitations. None of them are perfect. They're different tools for um, different jobs. And hopefully you'll discover the, the right tool, the right method uh, for your proposal this semester. That's all for now. Take care.